Hello, everyone who's coming in. Welcome. How are you? Uh, please go ahead and say hello in the chat. Tell us who you are, where you're from, what the weather is like. I can tell you I'm coming from dark and dull Dublin today. Uh, so we have a great webinar lined up for you. Um, we'll just give it a minute to let people come in. So go ahead, introduce yourselves. From Romania. Yeah, there's always a good Romania crew, all right. <laughs> Grey Brussels. Ah. Oh. What about what about where you are, Antonella? Maria Rose is probably lovely and sunny, is it? No, not so much actually. It is it's flooding today, so <laughs> and it's it's pretty cold. Is it? What's pretty cold? So for Rome, on. for Rome, of course. What's pretty cold? To find, yeah, give me. Uh, it's about six, seven degrees. Oh, that is actually pretty cold. Yeah, yeah. So you see, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I was. I thought you were about to say I'm like fifteen degrees. No, 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 no. no. Today it's, it's, a, it's it's a bit cold and it, it really uh, raining cats oh. and dogs, uh, as you say there. That sounds familiar. <laughs> And we've got some Croatians. Brilliant. So nice, nice mix of people. I'm going to start sharing my screen for the slides, Francesca, and you can you can start. Thank you. Start us off. Thank you. And just give me a nod when you want the. Uh... Perfect. Thank you everyone to be here. I'm very happy to uh, introduce this webinar that is named the Critical Thinking in Education. We will have three great presentations from Antonella Pocha, Maria Rosaria Re from U Roma Tre University and Orla Fenin from du Dublin City Universities. I'm Francesca Menduni and I will co-moderate this webinar with Orna Farrell. That is, uh, um, we are a member of Eden uh, Steering Committee NAP. Um, so please, uh, or no, thank you. So uh, the, uh, I will briefly tell you something about the network of academic and professional. Then uh, we will open up with uh, the presentation from uh, Antonella and Maria Rosaria, the role of museums and digital storytelling in the development of students' critical thinking in higher education. And then we will have a presentation from Orla uh, regarding critical thinking in business model and how to apply it in real life situations. Then we will close the presentation with a question and answer session. And if you want to continue the conversation, we will uh, move on uh, Twitter for our Eden chat that will start at 6 p.m. Now I want to uh, give you some information regarding uh, the activities of the NAP. Um, so uh, the, the, missions, uh, the mission of the NAP are uh, to support networking between among hidden members, professional collaboration and knowledge sharing. To achieve these purposes, uh, we organize different kinds of activities uh, included webinar like uh, this one and hidden chats and many other kinds of activities. Uh, I want to, sh to show you briefly who are the member of the Eden NAP steering committee. So um, we have uh, uh, um, uh, Vlad Miescu that is the chair of the Eden NAP and uh, Orna Farrell is uh, new, the newly elected deputy chair. So congratulations Orna for this new role in the, our, our NAP steering committee. Uh, there are uh, other members are me, Francesca Menduni, Igor Balaban, Mohamed Samer, Hassan, Alfredo Suhero and Ines Gil. Arena. And now I'm very happy to announce the first two speakers uh, from Roma Tre University, Professor Antonella Pocha. Uh, she is a senior uh, Eden Fellow and currently associate uh, professor at uh, Roma Tre University. In the, uh, uh, she teaches experimental pedagogy. 
at the uh, Department of Education, and she directs also the Center for Museum Studies and two postgraduate courses, both in the field of museum education. She uh, coordinates uh, national units with European project frameworks, and she has been chairing international academic committees dealing with distance learning. And she's also author of different publications of national and international relevance on the topics of innovation, assessment, and the use of technology in teaching uh, and learning in the context of heritage fruition. And I will present also uh, uh, Maria Rosaria Re, Dr. Maria Rosaria Re, a collaborator and colleague of Antonella. Uh, she's a research fellow at the Center for Museum Studies University of Roma 3, and she's also an Eden Fellow. Uh, in 2020, she obtained a PhD in experimental pedagogy. She used to be a temporary researcher at the Department of uh, actually, Edu. Actually, so sorry if I interrupt you, but she, she is. She is. Yes, she, she's currently, uh, yeah. she's currently a temporary researcher at the Department Re of Education. Research Fellow, yes. And uh, um, she carrying out research in interactive teaching and learning online with specific reference with to massive open online courses. And uh, she has been co uh, she cooperates with the Center for Museum Studies since 2013. And uh, she um, uh, she's part in national and European research projects in the field of museum education, digital and transversal skills critical thinking promotion, and new learning methodologies and evaluation. So I uh, give the floor to Professor thank Antonella you, Poche you. to start her presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Francesca, for this introduction. Uh, and sorry if I interrupt you, but actually, uh, Maria Rosario will tell you more. She is, uh, she is uh, um, um, still a... a research fellow at our Department of Education and cooperating and working actively within the Center for Museum Studies at HF. So thank you so much. I'll, I'll start the presentation uh, in a minute. I'm trying to share the screen. Uh, we had the trial a minute ago, but of course, uh, okay. So. Thank you so much, Maria Rosaria. I will ask you to go forward. Anyway, we, we have been working on critical thinking in education, in particular in higher education for many years now. And uh, we have been developing this uh, uh, very complex uh, um, skill and uh, construct, I, I would say, uh, mm, from different different perspectives and in different uh, uh, fields uh, at different levels. Uh, today we will try, please, the next the next one. We will try to uh, tell you uh, about the relation that we have been investigating uh, between critical thinking, the use of technologies uh, in education, in particular. Of course, we refer to uh, the uh, post-pandemic uh, era uh, because this is a time when we have been forced uh, to use technologies um, at, in, a, at every moment uh, in our lives. Uh, it's true that, of course, also before the pandemic came in, we technology every uh, uh, time uh, of our in our days is is made of using our mobile phones is made of uh, uh, accessing the internet is made of uh, um, uh, working uh, with uh, our computers. Uh, but uh, what we have learned, especially during this post COVID uh, uh, time, is that we need to use to to be able to use technologies in a critical way uh, we need to understand what's uh, the best uh, technology to be used according to different situations and in this um, situation of uh, choosing 
uh, of this of making decisions of solving problems, we develop um, cross-sectional soft skills, and we need to develop soft skills, that sort of soft of soft skills, um, which are linked to digital uh, technologies, but are not uh, only uh, related to how to use certain uh, technologies. Um, the uh, idea of supporting uh, the ability to use uh, technology, technologies, to know how to use technologies, uh, can be um, fed, uh, can be supported, uh, can be enhanced exercise practice um, in our view with the, uh, you, the, the support of cultural um, relevant uh, uh, topics and environments. That's why, if we go on, um, that's why we uh, try to, um, and this, is, this slide is, is related to what I was saying before, that's why um, we uh, try to, um, to work on the development of different kind of activities and projects uh, based on cultural uh, um, environments, on especially uh, museum settings and um, heritage uh, settings. What we have done, of course, critical thinking skills um, are at the basis, and I, I'm sure that with the next uh, presentation by Orla, we've been, we will be um, uh, driven to uh, a, a situation where these kind of concepts are developed. Of course, critical thinking skills are pivotal to have innovation, to have economic and knowledge growth. Uh, different kind of uh, um, uh, agencies support the development of critical thinking skills. They are part of all the frameworks that from different kind of uh, um, de decision making agencies come from. If we go on, if we go on, please, Maria Rosaria. Yes, thank you. Um, and so, not here, thank you. Uh, so the idea uh, that we promoted in the project that we are going to, to present to you uh, now is related to the possibility to link critical thinking um, strategy, enhancement strategies to the field of uh, heritage uh, education. Uh, I'm referring to heritage in the most wide, uh, the widest sense uh, and meaning that we can attribute to the term, uh, because we will see that what we have been trying to do through this uh, uh, technology is uh, uh, to mix different kind of uh, mm, of uh, uh, cultural uh, aspects uh, uh, in order to. Uh, support and, and enhance critical thinking skills. Uh, what we have done, we meant uh, um, to, uh, and I'm really sorry that I can't move from one slide to the other because of course, Maria Rosaria can read my mind, but <laughs> not, not completely. Uh, the main objective of, of the project that I'm going to, to introduce you today uh, is related to the idea that uh, museum objects in particular can be a uh, means of uh, interaction uh, of uh, mm, situations where uh, borders are uh, eliminated. In fact, the project is set in a wider uh, project uh, that is uh, the Inclusive Memory Project, a project promoted and supported, funded by our university, University Roma 3, 
and which involves seven different departments. So interdisciplinary um, aspects are taken into great consideration. Uh, I was telling you this wide project where, where the Etruria one is set uh, is a project aiming at uh, showing the uh, ability of museum objects to uh, be uh, tools for inclusion. So <clears throat> inclusion, again, in the widest meaning uh, that possible, is the object of our uh, research. In this case, the Etruria uh, environment that we created uh, was uh, um, meant at the very beginning uh, of the project to support uh, physical, face-to-face, in-person visits at a, a museum, in particular a museum uh, called uh, Museo Etrusco uh, Villa Giulia in Rome, where, as you might imagine, uh, a very important Etruscan collection is uh, um, uh, preserved and exhibited. Uh, after the COVID came out, we couldn't, of course, support this kind of visits uh, with our students and with other uh, uh, use kind of users uh, that we wanted to uh, include and make them participate in our activities. So we developed this environment, which is a, a museum, uh, actually, uh, a new sort of museum, virtual museum, where a um, specific activity is created. Uh, what did we do? Uh, we started from a first main assumption, uh, the one that makes the object talks about its history, its uh, uh, story, um, and telling us its story as a, as a, a short uh, a short story uh, involves uh, the user uh, in a sort of personal dialogue uh, with it. Um, different authors underlined uh, the way our objects uh, and our um, making stories is part of our uh, uh, human development. As children, we uh, make sense of reality, we um, tribute meaning to reality around us, telling stories or listening to stories. So what did we do? We created this uh, uh, virtual museum with some uh, specific um, uh, educational path taken and uh, built according to uh, the, the, the objects that we chose for each a specific educational path. The one you are seeing in, in the images that are going on are related to a specific uh, topic that we developed, that is the um, way women uh, were considered uh, and how uh, their lives were, were, were uh, conducted during the Etruscan uh, uh, time. Uh, so, starting from different objects, the objects that you can see in this uh, image here, uh, we developed some stories together with, uh, uh, of course, uh, experts in, in the field of archaeology, and so very uh, well acquainted with uh, uh, the history and uh, uh, the uh, artistic value also of the objects that you can see here. Uh, educators uh, and, uh, of course, uh, um, uh, engineers and uh, designers. Uh, together, we uh, made up the stories connected to each uh, object and we developed the, uh, the system where um, we tried to um, involve the users with different evaluation tools. 
from the very beginning, and I think we saw the image uh, from the very beginning, uh, we, uh, when the user is enters uh, the system, we uh, developed uh, some questionnaires to understand the uh, individual preferences of uh, uh, the user. And according to these individual preferences, uh, um, uh, address and uh, guide uh, the uh, user within uh, our virtual uh, museum. Uh, within uh, the museum, they are they have the users have the possibility to listen to the story connected to uh, the object. Uh, they can also have the possibility to connect to to uh, listen to a soundtrack uh, related to uh, the uh, the object. Um, and uh, in the end, they have a, a, a different tool to understand, to reflect on what they experienced. Um, through the collection of the data that we got uh, um, after using this, uh, this system, uh, we had the possibility to uh, evaluate uh, the, uh, the experience, especially uh, trying to um, reflecting on the the possibility of enhancement in critical thinking uh, levels. Uh, here you have some data, uh, but I won't go through them because time is very uh, short and I would need to, um, to describe uh, the results in details. If we stop to the previous one, the one where we explain how the the project was carried out and what were the data that we collected through different tools within the system. You, you can see that besides personal data to develop um, the, the user's profile and so to understand where to guide uh, our users, uh, we worked on their general uh, artistic preferences or on their favorite activities and mood on uh, the dimensions of extroversion and introversion that were connected to some of the results that we collected, uh, on their preference for the museum objects that were selected and or on the related contents, the narrations, the, the stories connected to, uh, to the objects, and uh, their uh, preferences related to their museum experience preferences, so uh, virtual, physical, or blended. Um, we <clears throat> uh, collected data and analyzed data related to their kind of engagement. Uh, and of course, uh, we reflected and we analyzed their critical thinking levels uh, enhancement. Um, if we go on, we'll see different kind of, uh, of uh, um, graphics and um, results from the first pilot phase to the second pilot phase. As you might understand, in the first pilot phase, we had just a small group of uh, participants, about 20 people, and actually um, with specific characteristics because that first group was made mainly of uh, um, experts in the field of uh, museum education. Uh, and so with mm, uh, very peculiar preferences. The second pilot phase instead was characterized uh, by the participation of more than 100 uh, uh, students, higher education students uh, from our department. So completely different uh, mm, uh, profile characteristics. Um, if we go on, uh, we can see that besides uh, uh, the um, possibility to understand if we let's go to to the final one uh, mm, yes no the previous one uh, exactly uh, here um, we we can see that besides the differences in the characteristics of the two groups first one a very small group and second one a very 
more consistent one. Um, uh, besides the differences, and so the possibility to uh, um, highlight the certain um, functions of uh, uh, the narratives of the stories that we connected to uh, each object and to the way that the immersive experience in this um, uh, technologically advanced environment was developed, uh, we, we, we can um, uh, say uh, that besides the preliminary dimension of this research, um, anyway, uh, some uh, guidance for further developments, for further research are clearly um, uh, highlighted. Um, first of all, this idea of designing a virtual uh, reality uh, exhibition according to um, uh, a certain uh, um, content and design and educational path and the possibility to engage uh, users and to um, link uh, the, uh, the, 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 the story to their own personal uh, background um, not with the intent of uh, uh, making them learn about an Etruscan collection or the Etruscan uh, history or Etruscan art uh, and uh, um, archaeology, uh, but uh, to understand and to uh, learn how to reflect uh, on their own um, their own uh, cultural identity, uh, their, their own uh, way of interpreting uh, reality, and uh, so, um, so doing, uh, exercising, practicing their uh, critical thinking uh, skills and dispositions. Um, I'm not going in detail to the to the um, results, but we uh, found that there's a, um, a, a, a general um, con connection, correlation uh, with, uh, between uh, the virtual uh, exhibition and the appreciation of uh, uh, certain objects' uh, uh, narratives, uh, which is perfectly in line with our uh, pedagogical uh, uh, hypothesis and starting hypothesis. So uh, the idea of combining uh, digital storytelling mm, and uh, uh, reflective question methodologies uh, um, which is at the basis of the, this project and other projects that we have been carried out, carrying out uh, uh, on uh, critical thinking development is, uh, uh, is there and supports, supports uh, further uh, research in, in the field. Uh, the use of technology, the use of uh, uh, virtual reality uh, environments uh, uh, and also uh, some uh, immersive uh, um, situations su support uh, the idea of uh, um, uh, enhancing critical thinking skills. But um, I hand here my, my presentation and I think that Maria Rosaria's uh, presentation uh, will develop uh, and other, other kind of aspects, uh, always within this main framework of the research we have been carrying out at the, mm, the Center for Museum Studies, uh, Roma Tre University. Please, Maria Rosario. Thank you, Professor. Um, exactly. Also, my presentation is extremely linked to the idea that cultural heritage can support the development of critical thinking skills 
in education, both in formal and informal contexts. And in this presentation this evening, I just want to introduce to a project that I uh, carried on during my uh, PhD um, period, the Nomina Sunt Conseguenza Rerum project, um, which main aim was to um, um, design learning path for secondary school pupils, so not for higher education institution curriculum, but uh, mainly focus on sec secondary school students that can support critical thinking promotion through the use, the fruition of a particular museum object that are Latin inscriptions. The idea of combining critical thinking in museum context is extremely linked to the uh, presentation that Professor Boucher did before, because um, the museum context, the museum object, in general are uh, underlined as um, pivotal for the development of active citizenship and also for the development of a person in the total idea that we can have. Um, in uh, um, life le learning idea of education, the relation between formal and informal education should be supported. So, the nomina sunt consequenza rerum started from the idea that we have to create a sort of integrated learning path between museum and school, where competencies and skills are developed together uh, through the use of specific learning um, path and methodology <coughs> used for this purpose. Um, um, as regards the learning approaches that support critical thinking development in museum contexts, for sure the idea of the active learning, the constructivist approach, the social constructivist approach uh, should be underlined because it's when visitors, users are um, part, an active part of their learning, only in this situation we can find a real promotion of transverse skills competencies. Um, as regards the references uh, from the literature of the sector, hands-on and object-based learning, visual thinking and digital storytelling are, are defined as the main important learning methodologies to be used within museum contexts in order to support critical thinking education. And this is because the active part of the users or because we are completely involved in thinking routines and thinking activities and also because the collaborative process that we make when we are part of, for example, a digital storytelling process. So um, critical thinking is extremely linked to this kind of particular learning methodologies. And um, the, the use of Latin inscription as museum objects, a very particular museum objects indeed, in these experimentations, uh, wants to uh, start from the idea that language communication is at the basis of critical thinking. A good critical thinking is also a good, uh, have, have, has also a good knowledge of his or her language. Uh, she or he can use it very well. So the idea to connect critical thinking and language skills is uh, related thanks to this um, research hypothesis. In the Nomina Sunt Consequentia Rerum, um, 144 uh, pupils from uh, two different vocational schools um, uh, participated uh, in the project. Um, 
we divided for sure the group in an experimental group composed by four classes and a um, control group composed by three classes. Uh, the students uh, involved are 15, be between 15 and 17 years old. And uh, the museum context was a particular uh, museum contest is the, the Musei Capitolini. It's one of the most important museum in Rome. And the Museum Capitolini is composed by two different buildings. In this picture, we have just one building. And the aisle that uh, connects the, these buildings is the Galleria Lapidaria. You can see is a sort of aisle, aisle where um, the Latin inscription from the um, imper um, Latin period, uh, periods are based on the left and the right of the aisle itself. So users and visitors can read or simply touch the object just walking on through this aisle. Um, the school uh, and the participants involved in the project uh, participated in into three different activities. Um, each of them were um, devoted to one particular learning methodology, so object-based learning, visual thinking, and digital storytelling. One activity of object-based learning was conducted within the museum and the digital storytelling workshop at school. Um, the critical thinking assessment tool was a test uh, that we um, used at the beginning and at the end of the experimentation. Uh, and from just um, a combination um, um, analysis between the results, we can see uh, through the dependent t-test between pretest and post-test scores of the experimental group, that the differences in the scoring is not due to the case. So critical thinking is was really promoted during the activities. There was a promotion probably uh, thanks to the learning path at the end of the uh, Nomina Sunt Consequential Learning Project. So um, the um, important point that I want to underline that is that these students, even if they are part of vocational students, so school that are not completely linked to Latin and culture and humanistic in field in general, were completely engaged by the activity, uh, especially by the digital storytelling ones. So they um, had the possibility to use uh, technology in a very innovative way because museum was not part of their life before this project. And they have also the possibility to promote their critical thinking skills. So I want to stop my presentation and to thank, thank you, Maria Rosa. Gosh, you had some beautiful pictures there in your presentation. Um, and, I, and I love seeing the, the kids engaging as well. Fantastic stuff there. So in a second now, Orla is going to uh, start speaking. And I just introduced Orla. So Dr. Orla Feeney is a chartered accountant and associate professor in accounting from Dublin City University Business School, or DCUBS. She lectures predominantly in the area of management accounting and research methodology. Her research includes the role of accountants in business, the impact of digital technology on accounting and strong structuration theory. Her work has been published in journals including Accounting, Audit and Accountability Journal, Qualitative Research in Accounting and Management. And she's the module coordinator for a really interesting module about critical thinking in business that she's going to tell us about today. So over to you, Orla. Excellent. How are you doing? Thank you for that introduction, uh, Orna. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, hearing uh, Antonella and Maria's presentations. As you'll see, in terms of my content, the discipline I'm talking about today is vastly different uh, to the two guys, but it was interesting how much I recognised some of the concepts or a lot of the concepts that you were talking about. So, you know, we're all very much on the same page 
Um, yeah, so listen, yeah, Orla Feeney, I'm Dublin City University. I, I'm primarily an accounting and finance lecturer, um, and I'm a director, director of the accounting and finance program in the business school. But I'm speaking to you today because I was part of a team um, that developed and now delivers a module entitled Critical Thinking for Business uh, within the business school. So this is a very practical walkthrough how we developed the module, what the module is all about, and so far how it's landing. And we just kind of hope that those insights might be helpful to any of you out there that are about to embark on a similar project. Hold on now, and I try and be as slick as I can about sharing my screen. Uh, here we go. That's not very slick. Hold on. That's not great. Uh, just go, that's that's, that's perfect, Orla. Yeah. Lovely. Happy day. So listen. Um, what are we going to talk about today? 15, 16 minutes. That's what it's down to, unless I ramble off piece, which I generally do. Um, I'm going to talk about who we deliver the module to, the objective of the module, um, talk a little bit about how it was developed. Um, I want to speak about the content of the module, the learning outcomes and how we assess it. Um, I, I'll talk briefly about the feedback because I think it was important for us to understand how the module landed with the students. Um, at least in the first year. And throughout, I will try and speak to the online uh, environment and how we dealt with our pivot to the online environment in the last few months. Um, so first of all, who takes critical thinking for business? Well, it's a module delivered to all first year undergraduate students in the business school. Um, so that's six programs and it's about 650 students all in. So basically every single student that comes into us to take a degree in the business school has to take this module in first year. It's a prerequisite. It's part of it. That's actually really nice. That diversity of perspective is lovely for the students. You have accounting students sitting in there beside marketing students, sitting in there beside language students. So that diversity of perspective in the midst of a shared learning experience, we find it really useful. It's actually great just for getting kids to talk to each other as well and get to know each other and, and branch out a little bit. Um, the objective of the module is it's to develop their critical thinking skills um, and Listen, it's quite intentional that we're doing it in first year. Uh, we want to get them young. We want to get them the minute they come in the door because we want to try and instill in them some strong theoretical, a strong critical thinking foundation on which to build their core discipline content. We don't want this module to just be a module in its own right. The idea is that we give them skills in this module that we hope helps them in their degrees, in their relevant degrees. We want them to go and study accounting to better effect. We want them to be better at their marketing. We want them to engage to better effect with their MIS information. We want to build their discipline, we want them to um, build their discipline content on this strong foundation that we're going with uh, in this module. The initial challenge, because they're first years and they're only in the door, was really to try and help them to understand what critical thinking is beyond the rhetoric, beyond the buzzwords. Um, it, it's a bit of a buzzword. And, and the kids come in and they go, oh yeah, critical thinking, but they don't actually know what it is. And you know what? Until we were in the midst of this project, I don't think we were particularly in tune with what it was either. So what I do is I start by telling them a story. And I'm going to tell you guys the story as well. Has anybody uh, ever heard of Stanislav Petrov? Stanislav Petrov was a lieutenant colonel in the Soviet Air Defence Forces. He was serving as a chief officer on duty in a bunker outside uh, Moscow on September the 26th, 1983, at the height of the Cold War between the US and the Soviet Union. Tensions were at boiling point. The Soviets had just shot down a South Korean civilian flight with a US senator on board. Reagan had denounced the Soviet Union as an evil empire. Nuclear war was a very real possibility. Um, so much so that at, both, at that time, both um, sides had built up fairly significant use nuclear arsenals. And on this particular day in 1983, Stanislav Petrov was on duty in a bunker when the Soviet missile early warning detection system detected five incoming American missiles. The siren sounded, Stanislav's instructions were clear. He had to inform his superiors that war had begun and the Russians must prepare their arsenal of warheads in retaliation. It was going to be nothing short of nuclear annihilation, but Stanislav's instructions were clear. There was a protocol. He must follow the chain of command. And remember, this was all taking place in a matter of seconds. His fellow officers had caught up with the situation. They were shouting at him to get on with the next step. But Stanislav instead calmly called the duty officer and informed him that the Soviet's missile early warning system was faulty. 
He said uh, his colleagues were enraged, but as chief officer, he had the final word. word. What gave him the confidence to go against protocol in this way? Well, he thought to himself, if the Americans were going to launch an attack, it would have been all out. They would have had to overwhelm the Soviets' missile defences in one foul swoop if they had any hope of surviving the nuclear and the ensuing nuclear war. Why, why, why would they launch five missiles? Also, the ground radar had not detected anything, so he had no corroborating evidence. Weighing up the probability, Stanislav decided that a malfunction was more likely. And of course he was correct. The missile early warning system had misinterpreted reflections from low clouds and incorrectly set off the sirens. Stanislav's insistence on reasoning before reacting had averted nuclear annihilation. Stanislav was a hero, and arguably we all exist today because of his ability to think clearly and rationally, understanding the logical connection between the different facets of the decision. Five missiles, no corroborating evidence, the natural Russian response. No, this doesn't make sense. And the reason I tell that story is to try and help the students to internalise what we mean by critical thinking, because there are so many different facets to it. Uh, And we want them to dial into all of those different dimensions of critical thinking in the different aspects of this module. Um, In a word, what I start with with the students is by saying, guys, we've gotten really bad at detecting falsehoods. We have access to so much more information than we ever have in the past. But that has increased the necessity for us to discern good information from bad information. I I tell them that 59% of articles shared on social media are shared by people who don't even read them. We have, if it appears glossy, we take it that it's legit. We've gotten really bad at detecting falsehoods. Brexit, COVID, American politics. We have examples everywhere of how Uh, critical thinking has been labelled as liberal elitism by over-intellectualism. We're not allowed to debate things anymore. So we have to try and pair that back and get these students to start examining everything that they encounter, all information that they encounter, uh, and start examining it in a critical way. So listen, I'll get off my soapbox now and get back to the actual project. Um, How was the module developed? It was as a result of a a curriculum review project. We were all taken aside two years ago in the business school and we were told, right, we want to reformulate the curriculum of the, of the six undergraduate programmes. And it, as part of that, one of the key goals um, of the business school uh, was to produce graduates who can make decisions in an evidence based man- manner. OK, so I was part of a cross functional team and we were charged with incorporating evidence based principles into our undergraduate degree programme. Um, And the first step in this, we felt, was to develop their critical thinking skills. Listen, it aligned with a clear call from the marketplace and the national skills strategy in Ireland for enhancing the critical thinking skills of graduates. This is a slide I actually throw up for the students because they really like it. Um, It really makes them feel like this is relevant. This is going to help them in terms of their graduating and and, and getting a degree. The World Economic Forum announced in 2020, and I'm imagining when they have time to update this, critical thinking will be even higher. But it was the second most important skill in any graduate entering the the workforce at the time. The students really respond to that, really advising them just how much employers want them to develop this skill. So listen, a little bit more about the project. Um, It started out as a broad cross-functional team involved in the development. So there was like 16, 18 of us sitting in a room with a whiteboard going, right, what would we do in order to develop the critical thinking skills of our graduates? We pretty quickly decided we wanted to develop a first year module because we thought it was critical to get them straight away. Um, And the first thing is we dreamt big. OK, we started out by, well, in an ideal world, what would we do with them? OK, if we didn't have any of the uh, strains and stresses of, of, of and then and, and the infrastructure that we have to fit in, what would we actually do if we had a blank canvas and we could do whatever we wanted? Then after we dreamt big, dreamt big and after we came up with a grand plan, we reworked and reconfigured that in light of teaching resource timetable program structures. And you know what? What we ended up with wasn't so different from what we initially envisaged. It was a little bit more realistic. It didn't involve as many hours. Um, We had to tone down the assessment. But on the whole, that idea of starting out with a blank canvas and dreaming big, not starting with the problems, not starting with the things that were going to be difficult to manage, no, starting with the blank canvas and what we wanted to achieve 
and then moving on to how we would achieve it within the confines of the infrastructure of the school, that was really, really helpful. Uh, we maintained that cross-functional approach throughout, and I cannot tell you how valuable and important that was. And even now, that initial broad cross-functional team of 16 or 18 people ended up reducing to the te teaching team of five that we have right now. So we have two accountants, an economist, and an organizational psychologist, as well as the business librarian. Sounds like the start of a joke, but that does uh, that basically comprises the team that delivers this module. Um, so what kind of things are we are we trying to work on here? We had to think about, well, you know, Stanislav Petrov aside and the World Economic Forum aside, what does critical thinking look like for students, business students doing first year in a degree program? Um, well, we talked to them about the need to, okay, finding out where the best evidence lies for the subject that you were discussing, uh, evaluating the strength of that evidence to move this here so I can see the strength of the evidence to support different arguments. And this was a big thing, trying to encourage them to subscribe to both sides of an argument. Uh, students are very much uh, inclined to subscribe to the argument that they already believe in. So a big thing that we do in a lot of our sessions is nearly forcing them to engage with the converse or the contrary opinion. Now that seemed to be something that's quite new to them. Um, encouraging them to come to a conclusion about where the best evidence appears to lead, uh, guiding the audience through the evidence, leading them towards the conclusion, selecting examples, and ultimately providing evidence to illustrate their argument. So as students, we want them to find evidence, evaluate that evidence, come to interim conclusions, guide the audience through the evidence, select examples, and ultimately present your own evidence having worked through it. They're the things that we really want to work on with them as students. The thing is, we always have to remember they are first years. This is a five credit module out of 60 credits in first year. It's one hour, one formal lecture hour or one to two formal lecture hours a week uh, over two semesters. This is not a high impact module. So we had to cut our cloth uh, in accordance with what we were trying to deliver here. Um, so with that in mind, I was gonna talk you through the learning outcomes that we deciphered for the module. So at the end of this module, again, five credits, about an hour a week over two semesters. So over maybe eight weeks, and then again, maybe four or five weeks in second semester. So it's not a huge amount of contact time, but at the end of all of that, we wanted them to be able to conduct reliable and effective library research with a particular emphasis emphasis on electronic information sources. Um, also teach them how to use appropriate citing and referencing techniques. Um, accessing and evaluating a wide range of information sources, which can be used to inform the decision-making process. Teaching them to go beyond Google, uh, teaching them how they can access information for all of their particular disciplines, encouraging the accountants to access professional information, encouraging the marketing students to access appropriate information for their discipline, but just getting them to access information just beyond your basic Google search, exploring issues, making decisions using well-researched facts, rules, concepts, and ideas, um, encouraging them to understand and recognize bias in decision-making or problem-solving scenarios and developing skills to counteract the negative impact of bias, um, helping them to think critically and logically when forming opinions and judgments, and ultimately combining insights from a broad range of disciplines um, and helping them to understand the importance of the weight of evidence in a decision-making scenario. Um, so th that's what we wanted to achieve with the module. So listen, a couple of slides on how the actual module works in terms of nuts and bolts on a weekly basis, okay? So sometimes the students are in a large plenary session like that one, okay? And the objective of these large plenary sessions is to disseminate content, explain concepts, go through the basics. Um, this year, because we couldn't sit in a room like that, we delivered these sessions in live Zoom sessions with approximately 200 students per session. Listen, we don't like Zoom sessions with 200 students. It doesn't feel like a nice way to teach, but we got a couple of TAs in for the sessions. We got them to manage the chat boxes. We broke them into breakout rooms every 20 minutes, half an hour, and got them to talk to each other. And, and you know what? It, it did the job. It worked. Um, particularly for those sessions where you really are just trying to go through content, go through basic concepts, 
to help them uh, deal with the workshops that were coming the week after. Um, we supplemented this with some asynchronous content, so they weren't overloaded with live content. So where we had particular tools and techniques that we wanted them to use in assessment thereafter, we would uh, pre-record this on as asynchronously and pop it up on uh, the web for them. Um, because we didn't want to overburden them in the live sessions. We kind of wanted the live sessions to be fun. We tried to have a bit of crack, as we say here, um, in these sessions. So we tried to keep them light. So we didn't want to overburden them. So they were the live plenary sessions. Um, sometimes students worked in smaller workshops. And this was really, this really came out of the curriculum review project. We were very invested in breaking these guys into small groups and dealing with them in small numbers. 650 that wasn't easy. That was enormously challenging. And from a resourcing perspective, it was our biggest challenge, but we did it and um, it works. And that's why there's a big team of us delivering this module so we can still do it. Um, why do small groups look at it? It helps to foster greater engagement and create norms of academic citizenship. It's a very lofty way of saying it gets them talking to each other. And when they talk to each other, they internalize the things that we're trying to teach them. And when they're internalizing the things that we're trying to teach them, they're learning it properly. And they're going to utilize it in their other in their other modules. And that's exactly what we want to do. So this year, how did we manage that? Instead of getting them into small rooms, which is what we did last year. So what we did last year was we broke the 650 into 20 uh, small groups. And whoever was taking uh, that particular part of the module just took the workshop 20 times. It was a pretty hairy couple of weeks, but you got through it. Um, and the sessions were fun, so it wasn't tough teaching. It was enjoyable teaching, but it, it was busy. Um, this year, what we did, because we couldn't get them physically into the room, was we delivered 12, or 12 to 14 Zoom workshops, and we split those workshops into two breakout rooms, and it would be the key lecturer and a TA um, would look after them, and then we would flit over to make sure that the students got lecture or contact. So it worked out at about 25 students per breakout room. And it, it was it was OK. It, it was OK. We had to do a lot of work to get the students to talk um, on Zoom. Uh, Zoom is the great silencer where students are concerned. I've been finding at the moment. Um, but it, um, it we're getting through we're getting through the material and it's getting kind of better as the year goes on. Um, the module is based entirely on continuous assessment. Uh, the CA hap often happens in class. Um, and is spread throughout the year. So I'll run through the different components of the module. There's about five different components and there's a piece of assessment at the conclusion of each component. Um, so yeah, five components. So the first component of the module is critical information selection. Great session. It's delivered by our business librarian. Um, and he comes in and he really talks to the students about how to access information, how to discern good information from bad information. Um, and he just does some really, really interesting exercises with them. Um, he goes through transcripts from White House meetings and asks them their opinion on it. But then he shows them the same transcript with information not redacted as it was in the original. What's your different perspective on the information? Now, that kind of thing. Real life examples. Um, we move on from critical information selection to identifying bias. So this is a really, really interesting session. Um, again, it's done in workshop form. So they do it in small groups to encourage them to talk to each other about their biases. Um, they're given a piece of pre-work to do in advance. Um, and then they come into the session and they continue that work. And then they do another piece of work straight after. Um, they move from their identifying bias session into a session on evaluating evidence and academic reading. We think this is really nice because it's giving them access to academic reading at the beginning of first year. I believe we have a tendency to uh, focus in on academic reading in final year or at least in second year. We think it's really important to actually start them uh, on a journey of academic reading at the beginning of first year. So accessing information, accessing good quality uh, academic uh, literature and also how to use it, how to read it, how to read an academic article, how to process the material, how to reference it, how to cite it. Um, and then we break them into groups and we get them to do a piece of assessment um, on, on academic reading. In fact, what we do is we give each group an academic article and we get them to write the abstract. Um, and it just forces them to engage with the article. Um, the next piece, the fourth piece, is thinking critically about measurement. This happens in semester two. It's delivered by our economist, Rob Galanders. And basically, he's talking to them about numbers and statistics. And he encourages them to engage with um, measurement and to engage with numeracy and to challenge it and, and, and think, look beyond the numbers. And then finally, they come back to me at the end for critical reflection and argument and critical writing. So we talked to them about reflecting on their learning 
Uh, we do an exercise in class whereby we get them to reflect on the module. So it's a useful way of getting to recap on the module. And then we talk to them about critical writing and how to present their evidence in a critical way in terms of writing. And that leads into their final capstone assignment in which they write a critical discursive piece about a topic that they're choosing. Um, so semester one, semester two. So this is how the assessment breaks down. Again, just in terms of nuts and bolts. They do a quiz based on the library. They do uh, two uh, in-class uh, pieces based on bias. Um, they do a group piece based on their academic reading. Um, they do a kind of an assignment um, challenging numbers based on Rob's piece in semester two. And then they finish it off with a capstone essay, which requires them to draw together all of the different components that we uh, teach them in the module. Uh, Loop is absolutely critically important. Loop is our online Blackboard and it is enormously important in this module. Um, it was more important before we ever had uh, COVID. Uh, it was critical to this module anyway because of the numbers. It's utilised during lectures, it's utilised for communication, assignment submission. If we didn't use technology in this module, we just would not be able to do it. So we have a learning technologist in the business school who is um, our oracle and guru, and he uh, did enormous work in terms of helping us build uh, a technological infrastructure around the module. It just could not have happened without it. Similarly, the teaching enhancement unit, of which there are some uh, on this call, uh, were just enormously important in terms of uh, helping us develop a solid technological infrastructure around the module. Just would not have worked without it. Um, it's a heterogeneous module. Uh, they're not in the same place every week. Some weeks they're in a large plenary. Another week they're in a workshop. Another week they're doing an assignment on their own. Another week they're doing a quiz. That requires a lot of housekeeping and a lot of management. And the technology helps us to do that. Um, listen, in terms of feedback, we felt it was really important. This is the second year we're delivering this module. So at the end of first year, we gathered a lot of feedback from the students because we wanted to know how it was landing. And it was very positive. They enjoyed the module. I hasten to add that it's a low impact module. It's not very stressful. It's not very difficult. It's not designed to be. We want them to experience. We want them to learn. We want them to internalize it. We don't want them to be stressed out. So it is not a stressful module. It's kind of a fun module, but not an easy one. OK, we don't want it to be something that's just seen as a walkthrough, but we don't want them stressed out. We want them to really internalize the content. And I think by and large, they did. Uh, critical thinking pushes us to evaluate information. Um, these are the things that we really liked. Uh, I don't think I could have made the leap to third level without the module or it helps us to make the switch from the leaving cert. That's what we were really going for here, helping them move on from the second level mentality of really learning by rote and regurgitating in an exam to the third level of mentality of actually developing uh, knowledge and developing insight and how what to do with that knowledge. So that's really what we were going with. Um, let's get, uh, before we get our heads too big, let's look at some of the other uh, feedback as well. The things the students said at the end of the first delivery that they wanted more of, um, I would like more real life examples of where critical thinking is used. I would like to work more on applying critical thinking in business, more real life examples, please. And there was a lot of them. I think because we were conscious of it being first year, we felt they didn't have an experience base on which to build real life examples. So I possibly underestimated them. So in this delivery, we're trying to bring in an awful lot more uh, real life examples of critical thinking. Um, now, do you know that feeling where you can't remember what's in your next slide? There it is. So that's it, guys. That that concludes it. Um, I, I'll, I'll stop sharing because I'd say Orna and the gang are going to take over uh, in terms of some, uh, but happy to take any questions or, or, or deal with anything. Thanks so much, Orla. It's a Cheers. really interesting module. Um, and I love the mixture of small group teaching, um, the, the skills, the application, um, it's a really um, uh, brilliant module. And I think it's it's something that's really needed in lots of disciplines. Yeah, it was interesting listening to uh, Maria and Antonella. It, it's amazing how much I recognise some of the things you were talking about, and it, albeit in a vastly different... Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, because it's, 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 it's um, uh, of course, uh, according to the different situations, uh, you can adapt uh, the, the main uh, framework for critical thinking and assessment and assessment. And um, as I, I figured it out, 
uh, you mentioned the top skills and the, <laughs> the setting that was uh, at the basis of uh, our uh, work. Uh, so, um, but of course, it, it's uh, uh, it's like that, and and also um, many things that you mentioned in your presentation were. Um, touched and investigated in a project that we have been part of, that is the Critink Edu project, a European project uh, that actually ended um, uh, already one couple of years ago now, I think. Uh, yeah, uh, when yes, one couple of years ago, uh, where our department, our group was part of, and that was based on the revision of the curriculum in different in different areas, in different subjects, um, uh, in view of enhancing critical thinking skills in higher education students, different many different. Uh, subjects were involved, different departments from different countries in Europe. Uh, and the idea was basically uh, the one that you developed in, in, in your module. So uh, trying to adapt uh, every curriculum uh, to the idea of enhancing, supporting practicing and teaching critical thinking, which is possible, actually. Uh, you were presenting, uh, but there was a question in, in the Q&A session um, related to um, how to, uh, to teach. Is it possible to teach critical thinking? Yes. Uh, through these kind of activities that might be different. And of course, we, uh, me and Maria Rosario, we presented the, the, the cultural and heritage perspective, but that uh, perspective can be adapted to any, any field of study. Uh, we have been cooperating for so long um, with the University College of London, uh, where a center for object-based learning has been created and where they have uh, a large uh, number of university museums, so they can uh, um, go from one subject to the other very easily, but whoever, whatever teacher can go there and uh, be supported in using a museum object to teach their own subject and to uh, train uh, uh, young thinkers in their development, in their learning. Thanks, Antonella. I suppose we've time for maybe one or two questions. We're we're running a little bit over, but we don't mind, do we, Francesca? It's all good. We're flexible about the time. We're taking an Irish style. Um, yes. So, any, any questions? There was a couple there in the Q and A um, that some of you have already answered. There, yes, there there was one that especially. Uh, from from Vlad uh, related to the the situation and the fact the post COVID situation and the fact that uh, um, of, of course artificial intelligence is um, oh an AI one clearly yes uh, <laughs> clearly linked to the the, the 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 topic that we have been uh, discussing today. And uh, he's asking if this is a threat or an opportunity because, of course, dealing with artificial intelligence with a large amount of data, uh, we need to develop this kind of skills and we need to develop critical thinking and creativity also, absolutely. And he's asking, is this a, a threat or an opportunity? No, it's a, an opportunity, of course. We, we need to to uh, use this time and this kind of uh, uh, difficult situation anyway to develop uh, divergent thinking, growth, and uh, really have a change that in a very mm, tragic and difficult way is supported, uh, is prompted uh, by the pandemic true and we can't have robots stealing our jobs yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I have to I'm a bit obsessed with AI. I'm a bit obsessed with critical thinking and AI because I'm doing a bit of research on AI and accounting because I'm an accounting teacher and I want no. to be sure that we still exist 
So I'm very <laughs> keen to demonstrate how we will always need uh, judgment, critical thinking, creativity. And I actually think the more information, as I said to the students all the time, the more information we have, the more, the greater the need for critical thinking because the greater the need to discern good information. Yeah. Information. And I think your argument there at the start about how, how poor we've become at discerning uh, good information from bad, um, it's, it, you know, that statistic was incredible. Yeah. Um, and I, 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 I'm gonna, never going to admit that I ever share a thing that I haven't read. Um, I think any any more qu- There was one, one. I think we probably have time for maybe one more. People are leaving though, um, so maybe maybe we will just say thank you very much to everyone for your contributions, the panelists. Thank you very much. We were really interesting, uh, and to the attendees, thank you very much for coming along. Uh- that there's a question from Tatiana. Uh, I, I and I think is addressed to us. Uh, okay. Tatiana, don't don't worry. Please write to me privately. My email address is uh, easy to find, and or or contact Francesca. That can give you my my email address, and I can answer to your questions. Mm. With, uh, a, a Thanks, answer. Antonella. Yeah. And uh, someone was looking for you to share your materials, Orla, as well. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah, I'll yeah. Tell you, um, and you can. Do yeah, stuff. and I think I think the secretariat will share the slides and stuff as cool. well. Yeah, Perfect. fantastic. So That's thank you, one. everyone, very much. We're going to jump onto another platform now, yeah. onto <laughs> Twitter. Let me just give you the details there um, for participating. It's going to be a, a like a sixteen minute Twitter chat now. Um, so the hashtag is Eden Chat, and how you participate, we're going to put up some questions and you can put up some answers and try and remember to put in the hashtag and the A1, A2, A3. Um, so looking forward to seeing you on Twitter. Great stuff. Super. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks, guys. Take care. Bye. Enjoy the tweet chat. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you.